Welcome back to another episode of Decoded, a Lost Codex podcast. I am your host, Jesse, the writer, director, and narrator for the Lost Codex episodes. And today I am joined by Jack. I'm not going to say welcome back, Jack, because at this point you're just... You're just a regular. I'm a fixture. Host. You're just a fixture. You're and I think and I kind of want to do that with Dakota. I want to have Jack or Issei or Shannon. I'm going to start bringing Shannon back. Uh, I'd like to say welcome back for guests hosts, but like reoccurring hosts is just going to be like we have Jack. I've signed a house. I've signed a contract. I'm 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 hidden in a closet at the Lost Codex Studios. You are. You have your own Discord rank, actually. So you know what? I think. I think you're. You're. You're locked in solidly. Um, no, we say this week. You say is uh, busy with a whole bunch of stuff um, going on, and Shannon was supposed to be here tonight, but Shannon ended up not making it. Must have turned her back. But the record on show and got shot in the back or something. I am the only one who is reliable. <laughs> um. <laughs> But oh god, that sounded way more bitchy than I intended. Shannon's <laughs> never met Jack before, so if Shannon listens to this before actually officially, officially meeting Jack on chat, it'll be like, wow, who the hell is this guy? Um, but no, Shannon uh, had uh, some way cooler plans, and it's kind of good that she didn't show up tonight, because tonight's episode is is not really anything. There's no concrete topic today. So, as a fair warning to anyone listening, if you're on your way to work listening to this, or you're you're listening to this on Sunday evening. This there's nothing special about this episode. This is going to be one of those podcasts. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> there's nothing special in terms of theme about this episode. Thank Jack you. and I are very special, but we're going to be very specially disorganized tonight. Um, I'm going to say, speak for yourself. <laughs> there's there's no topic on role play characters specifically, or Forsaken, or Draenei, or BlizzCon. It's just going to be a ramble episode, and. But like a delightful ramble. Oh, like, a delightful! Like we're, we actually have our ramble kind of structured in our in our script here. We we have notes on the ramble, so it's... We, we do. We actually made notes for you, you know. We usually have structured notes for a real episode, and but we've got structured notes for our disorganized ramble. So you know, I have we, seething rants prepared for all of you. Oh yeah, wait till we. I think we're just gonna launch right into that. But the reason I'm, why I'm we're still <laughs> coasting off of those fumes, so why not? <laughs> The reason why we're doing this sort of uh, random ramble is because we're in that period right before everything is going to hit the fan. Before the storm is, is, is live. Like, I'm not talking the book. I mean, we are in that moment before the expansion pre-patch hits. And I really want to talk about... I, I, I mentioned I was on a Realm podcast earlier this week with Ro, and I mentioned that we're going to be talking about Horde morality this week. And I just thought... Not yet. Let's let's wait until the pre-patch before we start talking about morally gray horde actions and and the non-existent or the significantly less morally gray alliance actions and talk about actual meaning, what those mean, you know, how it's not just bad writing or good of the races, how it fits the horde. You know, Jack and I and Shannon were actually going to dive right into this and I just thought, not yet. That's fine. Let's wait until we have some actual material to digest. <laughs> um, in the past, we have so much more like great things to talk about, but there's so much more on the horizon rather than just divide it. Let's just all do it all at once. So we're going to wait. And tonight is just uh, just a shoot the shit kind of episode. So if you guys aren't a fan of anything, you know, if you really like the RP episodes, but you're not really a fan of the race episodes, or you really like the race episodes, but you're not a fan of the RP episodes, this is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be, uh, we might make this into a thing every now and then. We just have a kind of casual ramble rant fest, and we'll see where it goes. We'll see how well this does. Um, but before we do, we got to talk about news, and there's really not a lot of news to talk about. There's Battle for Azeroth pre-patch is hitting soon. They, they've warned that the PvP season is ending. And I kind of just wish Blizzard would, an- would announce when it is, because I'm starting to sweat with these mage towers. I'm like, uh, do I have two days? Like, uh, is, is this over on oh. Tuesday? Oh, goodness. And I don't think so. Everyone thinks it's the 17th. And because Blizzard's been so active in... They had a, they had a blog about what you should get done now and not wait, and the mage tower was the main focus. They've been really good about telling people to get the mage tower done. And so part of me wants to believe, and actually, 
our, our good Discord friend Leda said this as well, Blizzard should or is in the sort of spirit of letting us know and there's kind of this idea that maybe they will say, guys, here's your official two-week notice or one-week notice. Um, I would agree with that. I would expect that. By the way, we love Latus. We do. We Latus love Latus. Latus. Very dear to us. <laughs> Every now and then you might hear us drop the name Latus for uh, you viewers listening. And Latus is a... Um, Latus is a original Lost Codex fan. I believe he started watching us when we first started streaming. Just his little name popped up in stream. Along with Stannis. Stannis and Latus are one of the OG viewers. For some reason... It was just me who streamed at the beginning, not Jeff. For some reason, they they stuck around and wanted tolerated my obnoxiousness, and they are still around today. So, if you're part of our Discord community um, and you're participating in some lore discussions, Latus is often in there, um, being a a, a active a sword, oh. a sword. <laughs> He's got a sword. He does have a sword. I, 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 he is a sword. He's a sword in the darkness against against the horde. He's very it's he's formerly gray. He's very alliance, but very active member in our community. So we, this is really rambly, and we've just started. But um, leave it all in. <laughs> let's just no editing. We're just gonna. This is gonna be a dry cut. So not much news. Battle for Azeroth pre patch is soon. The PvP season is ending. They gave that warning. Blizzard, if you're listening to my podcast, I doubt you are. But if you are. Just tell us when the patch is dropping, please. Um, something I did learn yesterday. Uh, the spell burb, the friendship spell burb that you get off of Argus, is not going away in the pre-patch. It's actually going away when Battle for Azeroth hits. So if you have not gotten your Argus heroic kill, you still have until August 13th. Oh, the violet spell wing. Spell I was like, wing. what the fuck's that? The, the spell burb. Spell- the, the burb oh what it's a spell burb it's that's what it's called on, on like tw- i don't know there's like social media trending it's like friendship uh, spell burb and because with archimond in warlords there was the spell up on the memes there was the you remember the moose mount that dropped off of archimond yeah yeah they called it the friendship moose and now they call this one Aww. the friendship burb and it's called spell Aww. burb i want it more now um, so you actually have a little bit more time. I, I actually thought that it was going away in the pre-patch and someone from Perky Pugs corrected me and said, yo, dude guy, it's not ending soon. And I was like, whoa, and I already have mine, but that's good for anyone who's panicking. I believe Perky Pugs is doing a charity stream. So anyone who hasn't gotten theirs and they want in on it, I have the dates right here. There is a 12 hour stream for uh, Perky Pugs that are doing their final, final run. Horde Run is on Saturday, July 21st, noon to 6 p.m. Eastern Time uh, on Automatic Jack, and then 6 p.m. to midnight on twitch.tv slash Zyronic. And then the Alliance Run is on Saturday, July 28th, noon to 6 Eastern Time on twitch.tv slash dcarter, and 6 p.m. to midnight on twitch.tv slash alphagare. So if you want in on the Perky Pugs Runs, Look into there. They have a Discord with all the information. July 21st for Horde, July 28th for Alliance. You still have time. Now, on to the scripted part of the podcast that isn't really scripted. What's the script say? Let's where, take a look. Where should where should we jump in? Should we just jump in with Transmog? Already... Let's just jump in right in with, with Transmog. Thank you, because it's... I... There's... So, <laughs> there is a... I'm going to just let Jack talk about it. There, there's a problem on the beta... And Jack's shaking right now. He is he is shook. He is I am shook. shook. I am just internally and externally screaming. I'm not going to scream externally right now because that would hurt our microphones and your ears. But so I just did the ghost tower quest. Not the ghost tower quest. The mage tower quest for my ghost blades on my room. Cool. They're fucking sexy. I'm hop on the BFA beta to say, okay, I'm going to transmog this shit. Uh, with the new stuff, and I discover that when I transmog one of my daggers to the new artifact weapons, I transmog both of my daggers, like, with no choice. Like, both daggers get transmogged if I transmog one, and I cannot change. Like, if I transmog my main hand, the offhand gets the appearance too, and I cannot change the offhands. So that means that I can't be like, oh, I want 
maybe a ghost blade main uh, a special artifact appearance main hand but i want like the warlords of Dream or challenge appearance um i can't have that as my offhand so i'm mad because i wanted to do that and show everybody how exclusive i was but in general like i actually don't like the paladin shields and wait you can I, I like just, them i just came to a crazy realization and i know you and i talked about this for about a, a an hour before we started recording yeah you can change it on live right you can just go change one yeah. of your offhands mm -hmm. you can that's actually the thing i just described uh where i have a challenge appearance as my offhand is actually the way it is on live i have the sun blade as my offhand and the ghost blade as my main hand okay this definitely seems like a bug then i was i was not realizing because i just thought about my death knight and my death knight uh, dual wields the uh the broken pieces of frostmourne and I made each of his swords look different, and I that See, yeah. that just came to lie to mind right now. This seems like a mistake. I don't think Blizzard intended to so. this because that's just that's literally making the already restrictive transmog system from Legion. You know, Legion. I, I loved the artifact system. I thought it was oh, really too. cool, but it was so it was so choking on its restriction. That's basically Blizzard making it even more restrictive after it's irrelevant. Which to me is ten steps backwards. It that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it really sucks. Um I know it sounds like such a small problem to have, but you know, it, once you have a certain amount of freedom, uh especially in a system like this where it's just purely cosmetic and has no uh real gameplay impact, you expect that freedom to to and not to and so that's that's why I got a bee in my bonnet about that. And that what's bee. what's what's weird? What, uh, what's good is that Blizzard has acknowledged that there's some weapons that are a little bit circumstantial to how classes will operate in Battle for Azeroth. And for example, and, and I've made this argument. If anyone follows the Lost Codex on Twitter, you might have seen me post this several times. What if what if as a holy paladin? In Legion, you got really attached to the Silver Hand. You were like, this is a dope weapon. Because it is a dope weapon. It's one of the coolest weapons. It's it's the weapon of Tyr, the Titan Keeper. That's awesome. It's literally called the Silver Hand. But Battle for Azeroth, you're going to go back to using a shield and a one-handed shield and a, a one-handed shield. A one-handed sword and shield. So you can't really use that. So, so part of you is like, oh, man. Well, but what if you decided, oh, I'm also going to play. I have an Auspec. I like playing Rhett. Well, why can't you use the Silver Hand as a Retribution Paladin? What's yeah, you're still a Paladin. You're still a Paladin, and and there's actually, I believe it's the it's the PvP skin, I believe, yeah. for for Holy Paladins, and it's oh, like it's, like it's like a giant Judgment looking hammer. It looks like the Judgment Paladin set, but that's like the most Retribution inspired set ever. It's got the the scales of justice on it, and yet that's a holy weapon. That would look amazing on a retribution paladin, yet it's a holy paladin only. And I get Blizzard said that you know there's cla there's a class fantasy that it has to stick stick. You know, if you get a dagger as a holy as a holy priest in Battle for Azeroth, are you really going to use Zalatath? It's like no, lore wise you wouldn't. But lore wise, we're not bringing the artifacts with us in Battle for Azeroth. Oh, it's just a fucking dagger now. Their story's also, over. So go ahead. Is it is it class fantasy or spec fantasy that's more important? I feel like right? you know, general class fantasy is. And I can't really think of any instances outside of, say, Zalatath, where you're violating the class fantasy by, by using a different spec's weapon. And like, um, there's some weapons that are very particular. So like, Fellow Malorn is a, is a high elven, blood elven blade. And we know that it was it belonged to King Anastarian Sunstrider and Kaelfest Sunstrider, and they're represented as, as fire mages, so that's why it's the fire weapon. But if you really liked that sword, but you decided, you know what, the meta is ma making me swap to Arcane and Battle for Azeroth, but I really like the sword. Really? You can't use Fellow Malorn because it's it doesn't fit the Arcane aesthetic? That doesn't make any sense. That's... It, sure, Kale Fast was a fire mage, but it's not like he never practiced arcane ever. As you said, there's not many instances where it it you break your fantasy, and even if you do, the story of the artifacts is over. 
it's it's I agree with having your artifacts locked in Legion, but we're not taking them with us. We're actually that we're there's a whole storyline that's involving us leaving them behind as we go into battle for Azeroth. So if we decide to transmog that, that doesn't mean I'm in a, an Arathi warfront wielding the real Ashbringer because the lore wise, the real Ashbringer does not go into battle for Azeroth. It, we, we don't know what happens to artifact right, right now. Our artifacts are all unstable because of Sargeras' sword, but something's going to happen where we don't take it with us in battle for Azeroth. So at this point, what does the class fantasy, why enforce that? Yeah. When it's a feature that's obsolete right now. I I, so, I I think I introduced the Holy Paladin idea because I wanted to circle back, but then I got on a rant about the justice thing. But Jack's about right. About you wanting to use that on your, your justice set with the Ret, Ret Pally. Exactly. And I don't even have the weapon. It just looks cool. I, I, I want to see a Ret Paladin wield that. I don't For have RPers, it. For RPers, not PvPers. Exactly. I, I, can't, I can't PvP. Um, but Jack's right. Right now they changed it so that if you get a one-handed sword and a shield on Battle for Azeroth as a Holy Paladin, you can actually transmog that to your two-handed silver hand look in case you want to stick with that. So they're actually allowing you weapons that really break that obscure weapon type that your class doesn't really wield, like a, a blood... DK is always going to use a two-hander, so there's no issue with that. But a Holy Paladin so will like, not always use a whole a two-hander. And the Leap Room also still shows up. It does, on, yes, uh, the, the belt. Now, um, like, that's a great step in the right direction, and I love that. Uh, I don't know if I'd actually choose that over being transmog my weapons and offhands freely. That's me. Um, like, if there is a choice here, I don't know if there is. I don't know if it's just a bug or, like, a consequence of adding that system. Um We'll see. We'll see if we can get like a response from Blizzard or for somebody to take note. Um, but yeah, I, I want I want full freedom in what my character is wielding because I I I play this game to look pretty. Are you are you in agreement that artifacts should be locked to their class? I agree that they should be locked to their class because it, it really doesn't make sense for like my Death Knight to be wielding the ash a thing that looks like the Ashbringer. Right. I mean. Um, like that, I think that really actually does violate the spec, or not the spec, the, the class fantasy. Whereas, like, I can make my frost mage look like a fire mage extremely easily, and it still makes sense because it's like a mage is a mage, and the NPCs often mix and match uh, different facets from different specs. Uh, but I agree, I agree. yeah, I agree on the class restrictions, not spec restrictions. I think that there's aside from Zalatath. There's not a lot of cases where it is so groundbreakingly, lore-breakingly problematic that it's it's that it needs to be dealt with. I I just I don't see it as a problem, you know. If you want to, if you're, I'm just thinking of an example. Um, maybe you really like the unholy artifact as a blood de- as a blood death knight. And you really like the red, the red skin because you want to like have that blood aesthetic. But you really love the why? Why not? Like it just seems. Yeah. And and they did say the reason is because there's a class fantasy or a spec fantasy, and they use Zalatath. But it's like that's the only example that works. It. Yeah, I can't really. I, I mean, maybe I'm not thinking broadly enough here, but I can't think of any other. I, let's go through them all right now. Um, a a. <laughs> a fury warrior and an arms warrior. Why? Why couldn't a fury warrior decide to put down two weapons and pick up one? What? Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> a a or decide to put down those weapons and pick up a sword and shield. Why can't a rogue decide to throw one set of daggers away and pick up another set of daggers or pirate? Oh swords? god, rogue especially. Right, like it's Ro- just and we're all just fucking daggers and swords. It's... You know, there's the, the outlaw swords. It just seems to me like it's a step in the wrong direction. Um, and this this issue so, where Jack can't transmog his offhand, I do believe, is a bug. Because that's I hope it's a bug. Because that, that, just, just to remove that is... This, what? Ugh. I look sexy on live. I will not look sexy in BFA if they change it. Because I, 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 like, this is a set I've collected over like multiple expansions. Um, 
including this one. And I was excited to look really sexy. So one thing I'd, I'd add on to this argument is that BFA, to me, is being billed kind of as the customization expansion. And the reason I say that is because where before we had classes or like an entirely new race as the main feature of an expansion, we're getting allied races. And allied races, what they, what they largely offer is customization. The, the race, the racial abilities um, aren't that powerful. They aren't, dis and the, the races themselves that are being added aren't distinct enough to be like a fully separate race, like the Pandaren. Um, and that's why we're getting a ton of them. And, and the reason for this is we're, we're being allowed to have more customization. We're being given more freedom. And this is stuff that we've asked for uh, for years. And we're very, very thankful, Blizz. Thank you. Uh, so I would think that Transmog would follow in a similar vein, that they would allow us uh, more freedom, not restrictiveness, but more freedom, especially in an area where it makes sense. You know? they, they argued for a long time that uh, character customization is kind of a, a, a distraction. And I know that there's turnover plays and they will evolve on their thinking. I think that having transmog be less restrictive now makes sense with cur Blizzard's current philosophy on and the players' uh, perspective on it. We love, a lo well, a lot of us love the allied races. Uh, a lot of us love the uh, artifact appearances. So, you know, let's, let's, let's keep going in that vein. Let people customize. Let's let the people be pretty. Come on. And I'm, I'm totally on board with all of that because this seems like blizzard's way uh, I, and I, anyone who's listened to me talk about allied races i love the concept of allied races i think it is a ingenious thing to introduce um do i think that races will eventually return as a as a customized zone i do i think things that are a little bit more out of the blue like let's say an ethereal if we ever get playable ethereals i do think they'll be their own custom race not an allied race but allied races basically allows Blizzard to introduce races in patches. Race fantasy. There's race fantasy, and but I do think that it's possible allied races could be patch features through the course yeah. of an expansion as we meet new races and the story evolves as such. Um, so with all of that, you would think that you know tr just transmog in general would be a great opportunity to kind of let loose a little bit, but we're. Uh, we're not seeing that yet with the with the uh, with the tr uh, artifacts. So I'm uh, I'm hoping Blizzard changes their mind. And... I have one last thing to say on that point. All right, go ahead. If you agree with us, tweet at them. Tell them. Let them know. You know they're very receptive to things like this at this stage. But once BFA is live, you know they're they're going to focus on new content, not stuff that's already been hashed out, or or it's going to be much harder to make changes. So if you feel the same way, let them know. They're, they pay attention to you guys. They they may not always respond, but they listen. Agreed. So if you do agree with these uh, these transmog issues, and you want to see, you know, you want to be able to use your your cat form that you earn from the mage tower while you're in your tank form. You know, not in your tank form, but if you're in tank spec and you know something happens in a fight, you got to go to cat form. Guardian, yeah. Why can't you show off your uh, your laser kitty? Um, it just seems, it just seems silly. Um, so I'm hoping Blizzard changes their mind and I hope, and they did say that they might revisit, you know, in a later pat in a later patch, 8.1, 8.2, they might visit artifact freedom, but it sounded like we're doing it later in the expansion, not now. And it's kind of like, a, oh, like then I take back what I said about them not doing it later. Uh, <laughs> well, 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 but that could just be them pushing it off. We don't know. That's like, true. It wasn't confirmed. Yeah, we will come back to this. It was like, we may revisit this. And it's like, you know, I, I'm not going to say this is not a witch hunt against Blizzard because, you know, this podcast is all about supporting Blizzard and loving Blizzard. But there's things, this is the time for feedback. And yes, there's there's things that are, contra you know. No one on the on the on team two is should get offended by these words because no, we're not. There's nothing insulting about them. We disagree with them, and here's why we disagree. And I think a, a lot of people lose control of of any sort of feedback they want to give. They go right to the forums and they just aggressively rip into the employees. And these guys are sitting at their desk. These 
men and women are sitting at their desks reading these hateful comments. Why would you want to make a positive change when people are just being rude to you? So I always say, if you're going to offer feedback, A, treat them like humans. Don't just rip them apart. Give them. Here, don't speak on behalf of everyone. Speak on behalf of yourself. The, here is why I don't like X problem. And tell them That's why. That's all great. Yeah. And I, I, I did something similar with um, Draenei weapons. And I'm, there's, I'm not taking credit. But when Argus was first announced, I thought, oh my god, there are so many weapons and so many sets from Warlords of Draenor files that never made it into live. This would be the perfect opportunity for Ar for them to put them on Argus. So I, I made a post, and on that post I said, there is a huge amount of Draenei maces, Draenei swords, axes, staffs, daggers, all these uh, Draenei crystal scythes that never made it to live. We see them on NPCs everywhere on alternate Draenor, Shatrath, stuff like that, but it never got into player hands. And we know that there was a Shatrath raid planned at one point, so it's likely those items came from the raid. But the raid was scrapped, so the items never made it into the game. Fine. So when Argus was coming out, I made a post and I said, this would be a great opportunity to have a very Tanan jungle, uh, timeless isle sort of feel where different chests around the zone drop X, you know, have a chance to drop little pieces of armor or little random weapon models. In Tanan jungle, there was a lot of unique random weapon models that dropped, including a two handed mace for holy paladins or boomkin druids or something. It was a really weird weapon. And I posted this saying, there's a couple of armor sets, plate sets, and cloth sets from the Draenei kit that never made it into live, except for one color that came out with a Alliance Reputation, and then the Karabor set that came out in Tanan Jungle. There was a couple other colors as well. There's a couple of all these weapons. And I just said, Argus is the cool, is the proper way to do this. Put them on Argus, put them on Krokoon, Antoran Wastes, Makari. Let us get them through drops. This is probably the last time the Draenei are ever going to be relevant for years please. And the thread got so Let's much play. support. Like it was, people were like, this is a great idea. Oh my God. Couple beta builds later or PTR builds later. Bam. All these weapons are available everywhere. I'm not saying I'm, I'm taking credit for it, but maybe some, someone saw that and went, you know what? These weapons are just sitting in the files. Let's throw them out there. And it was more of a, just, just make, if you're going to give feedback, be polite, treat them like humans. There are people on the other side of the screen reading what you're saying, and Blizzard does care. I made the joke to Jack earlier that Blizzard hates fun, and everyone makes that joke, but I I truly don't believe that. I don't pe I don't think Blizzard sat down last week and said, Thank you all for coming. We're putting out another beta build today. And I think that we should ruin people's lives and take away transmog restrictions. I think we should prevent people from transmogging their off end. What do you all think? And the camera pans around to all these evil looking people and they all want, I like it. Let's ruin players' days. It's subversive. That's not what, that, Blizzard doesn't do that. Blizzard doesn't say, okay, how can we piss off as many people as we possibly can? Let's introduce Void Elves instead of High Elves. That'll do it. You know, but jokes aside, it's, that's not what Blizzard's doing. There's always reaction, reasons for them to do what they want to do, but we players may disagree. So and put you your offered in. A, so go ahead. You offered a good, um, I don't know, a, a good piece of advice there as well, which was offer constructive feedback when you when you go on the forums to talk about these things. Or just say, oh, I hate you, you, you ruined fun. Be like Jesse and say, oh, you know, maybe you could implement this on Argus, and you might make a Blizzard employee go, hey, that's a good idea. Well, and, and they may take your advice or they may do something similar or disregard it, but you know, it, it sets your tone as helpful and, and shows that you actually do care about what's going on. And honestly, feedback is what makes this game, you know, Blizzard wants, and the Blizzard employees always say like, we're reading the feedback guys, give us the feedback, but you know, don't be assholes about it. And something that's really cool. Let's shift it away, on the transmog train, but shift it to positivity with the island ex expeditions, there's all these different weapons 
from previous oh God, so raids hot. and dungeons. They're sets of colors that haven't been in game or models that never made it to live. And when I say made it to live, I mean in our hands. For example, the Monkey King's staff was only seen in the Monkey King's hand in Pandaria. That's an item drop in Battle for Azeroth now. Now, it's not his staff lore-wise, it's a look-alike. There's a couple new Naga tridents that were introduced in Cataclysm with the whole, with the whole Naga zone. Those are available in Battle for Azeroth. A lot of cool weapons, a lot of skin colors from weapons that maybe were in-game on NPCs and raid bosses that never made it to live uh, for players. Those are coming, so th- I think that's really Blizzard letting loose going, you know what, here's 40 weapons that you've never had before. Go nuts. And it's kind of like, damn, this is amazing. So I think I think the mistake, there is an honest mistake with the, with the artifact weapons with Jack's problem, and I hope Blizzard revisits the other mistake with artifact weapons that just allow you to use your weapon across all specs. Um, lock it to your clash, for, but keep it open to all specs, because Blizzard does seem to think that this is the time for customization with allied races and weapons of the yin yang amazing transmogs coming from a leveling experience um, oh my god let's talk about that let's talk about transmog and battle for azeroth what do you think of the transmog coming in battle for azeroth like the 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 gear is getting a little it's getting a little too ostentatious for some characters for some class fantasies uh or character fantasies like i don't necessarily want my mage to be wearing plates and crystals and all kinds of chains flowing around them and that but in, in Battle for Azeroth, you're getting these, these simple... You, you look like an NPC. You're getting these, not simple, but very elegant, streamlined armor pieces that we're seeing so far that are... I don't know. It's, 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 it makes me feel like an NPC. It makes me feel regal, but not ostentatious. Not like some kind of crazy fool um i hate to use feel a, about it so far. i hate to use an example but it's very specifically the terrassian gear the gear from cult terras it's it's very i don't want to say game of thronesy but it's very that 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 sort of medieval fantasy but not crazy simple boring old knights and wizard robes it's that it's that more simple and uh, i guess it's realistic versions except the cloth we'll talk about the cloth in a second but the leather just looks so good it looks you know there's 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 collars and there's jackets and there's belts oh my god uh the even the 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 male sets there's there's it's it's very it looks very um like you're a squire or a page or a a a uh not an honor guard in full armor but you're sort of a a lord in chainmail stylish leather kind of thing something that anduin would wear to a dinner party but like a dinner party with maybe a goblin because he's afraid he'll stab him or something uh the horde, totally. the the plate sets are very are just so heavy looking but like human heavy looking no crystals no crazy gems they just look like they're made by a human kingdom as they should um and of course, Zandalari armor. I know a lot of Horde players are kind of not disappointed, just turned off by it. But you're that's going- fair. It's very, it's very specific a style. It is. And my my counter argument to it is, you know, a Draenei will not look like a Draenei in the Tarassian gear. He, you know, the Draenei gear is very, very out there, very bright colors, crystals. It's very, it's a very different looking set of gear compared to what the Tarassians wear. But that's also an orc is not going to look look crazy good in the Zandalari gear because the Zandalari are just so out there. Bright gold colors. They have dyes of every color. Feathers from every single possible bird. Dinosaur bones of every kind. Bright gold. So people are like, I'm going to look weird on my Forsaken. It's like, yeah. Yeah, you will. But just get to Warfronts and you can put on some spooky skulls and stuff like that. Because that's another thing. The Warfront gear. Oh, man. Oh, man. The Warfront gear. Oh, my goodness. The the Warfront gear. On, on the Alliance, 
it makes you look like a high elf or like you could be a high elf or just like the most I keep using this word regal what i'm really liking is that they're they're doubling down on this uh this trend of adding model details like actual 3d d- details to pants and and chest pieces and so on um and you're seeing a lot of that in the warfront gear um and i think that it just opens up a lot of possibility for mix and matching your transmog and i love it i just i i, I that that is that encapsulates my feeling. I love it. <laughs> the thing I love about, love about the Alliance Warfront gear is, as you said, the there's three colors. Every, all the sets come in. There's like a silver blue. There's a metallic bronze gold and blue, and then there's a bright gold and blue. Alliance colors, and the silver blue is very high elven in appearance, especially the uh, the cloth and the leather looks amazingly high elf. In that sort of hot, and I don't say high elven as in high elf and wow, in that high fantasy elf style that we see in most fantasy games when you think of magical elves yeah. as these tall, beautiful, with these ornate armors. What high elves were originally were in the Warcraft universe, you get that feel from the armor, the high, the uh, Warfront Alliance, and all tiers. For anyone who doesn't know, the Warfront armor actually sort of upgrades. And gets more elaborate. So you've got the low version, and you look a little bit more simple. You look more lower rank, and as you go get progress further in war fronts, I guess, or PvP level or whatever, your gear gets more elaborate and more shiny and more detailed, which just and looks I, I'm so sure well. Will, I'm sure this will be the case, um, but I really do hope that you'll be able to still transmog to say an earlier period if you do upgrade it. Um, because you know you may prefer the the more simplified version of your art. I think so uh, because when you look at sets on the beta, the uh-huh. uh, there's three PVP sets and the green set uses like tier one. Tier three isn't in game okay. yet right now. There's tier three pieces, but there's no official tier three set like a full set in the set tab. But there are different sets four different tiers. So like a whole set of the green pieces that come from, I guess, boxes all use tier one version. Then off of rares, you can get tier two and they're two, two different items. So it's not going to be like you, it's not going to be like the warlords crafting stuff where you upgrade. So the sets are different pieces. So you definitely, you can be able to, you know, mix and match, use boots from leather one, but use the, the trousers and the chest from leather two and they use the same color concept, but it's just different models. Um, and Horde, Horde looks really good too because it, most of it is like super spiky, um, as typical with Horde. But there's there's some pleasant surprises um, I found with uh, the cloth robes. They were very not orcish. They were very almost regal. Like they had a very sort of studded, soft almost like an like it was blood elven in a way but then there was chains and spikes hanging off of it so it, that well, illusion actually. was ruined uh, but then there was like some uh some crazy huge horde logos on the belt buckles and stuff like that and they look really cool they the hor- the cloth versions didn't actually look super surprising or super weird on forsaken and actually some of the colors for plate actually look good as well so blizzard has two red sets and then a black bluish set that might look good on on Forsaken and other races like that. What I really hope with Warfronts is as more Warfronts come out, they put out more sets. So when we get to the Warfront number two, which is supposed to be the Barons in, I guess, 8.1 or 8.2, I hope that the armor that comes from there is different. I hope that they're... Because... And this is this is controversial. This is people... So I don't know if you're aware, Jack, but there's no more tier sets in Battle for Azeroth. Really? I did not know that. So when you go into Uldir, the first raid, as your priest, you, the cloth gear that drops from Uldir is the same for mages, warlocks, and priests. It changes Ah. color based on difficulty level, but there is no tier sets in Battle for Azeroth. 
So the question is, where did that uh, that artistic talent get offloaded? And you're guessing that's going to be in the war fronts. Well, here's – and I think it is because we have – now I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I did make a chart out of this, and I, I I don't I lost it. But there are certain sets set aside for leveling. So there's like one or two cloth sets set aside for leveling. So specifically, uh, there's the cult the cult tier is set for leveling for cloth. Cult tier is set leveling for leather, mail, plate. And then you've got the dungeon set for cult tier ass, cloth, leather, mail, plate. Um, and then the same for Zandalar. The crafting set uses one of those somewhere in between. So uh, same with Legion, where the the blue PvP Season 1 Legion set was also... It happened to share the same appearance as the tailoring set or the leatherworking set. So ta- tailors or professions don't share any sets. Then you had PvP sets were basically recolors of tiers in Legion. And the, the PvP set specifically, you are the... Warfront. So what's different in Battle for Azeroth is PvP armor seems to be using the Warfront appearance specifically with a interesting tier one cloth, tier two cloth, tier three cloth. So an upgraded version, three variants of each. So for tier one for cloth, there is color one, color two, color three. So there are nine variants of cloth sets for Warfronts. Three, tier one, three, tier two, three, tier three. And then for leather, there's nine variants for leather, nine variants for male, nine variants for plate. And you could argue that they're not exactly fully different, so the artistic offloading got put somewhere else. But I'm curious what this means for for armor in Battle for Azeroth, because sure. there is no tier set. And so clothies are all using the same set, different, you know, different colors for every raid level, heroic, alifar, whatever. But it does seem that I'm curious is where they, where do they put their foot? Where do the artists change their focus to? And I honestly don't think people say it's Blizzard being lazy. It's like, no, it's not. It's not Blizzard being lazy. It's as a, I mean, as a professional character artist, uh, I could tell you that I, you know, time is a constraint. (laughs) It takes a long time to make something, even a simple thing like a dagger could actually take a while. Right. Um, So. They're not being lazy. It's just we would love. I I say we. I don't work at Blizzard, um, but like artists would love to just do the whole, all the beautiful things. But we can't. We you know we we've got a, a time frame and a kind of a, a time budget, if you will. And I don't uh, think you have people to realize like how intense Blizzard's development schedule is because the person doing the raid sets isn't just doing the raid sets. They're doing other armor. They're doing other things. Yeah. There's so much on their plate. And people accuse Blizzard, Blizzard artists, of being lazy when it comes to when it comes to armor like that. Oh, this armor set looks boring. They were lazy. It's like, no, you just don't like the appearance of it. And you're entitled to that. You're entitled to not like something. But don't attribute your lack of interest in it as a lack of effort from the artist who did it. Sure. And... and- Oh, sorry, God. I was just gonna say that there is an there is a topic to, a dis- topic of discussion to be had about why did Blizzard shift away from the fantasy? And they said at Blizzard, they said at Blizzard, they said at BlizzCon, we've seen twenty one variants of what a preset looks like. That's and fair. it's like okay, fair. And they said we we want to make the armor look like it comes from the raid. So like the cloth, and you've looked at the cloth sets. You actually showed me some transmog jack of your of some of the cloth from Battle for Azeroth. You know the armored looking cloth, how it's yeah, looks like oh plate. totally, I love it. So that comes from Uldir, and it's supposed to look very Titan esque. It's supposed to look like it's a Titan keeper. It's supposed to look like it's not anything made by mortals. It's it, you know the faces have those the the statue faces uh, as the helm. Um, mm-hmm. Same with the plate, mail, and and leather sets. And it looks like it comes from a Titan facility, which is cool. But I guess a counter-argument is Blizzard has made armor sets in the past that fit both the race, or race, the class fantasy, and the raid fantasy. And the best example is Ice Crown Citadel. Mage armor used uh, San Lane as their inspiration. So they it was specifically... Ice Crown, Sand Lane, Vampires, and the armor set for mages was made around that. Yeah. Death Knights were given the Lich King set. Warlocks were given the Cultist look. Uh, Paladins were given just a, a righteous warrior. 
Uh, warriors were given a, a Vrykul set. It, it was all related to Ice Crown Citadel. And not that I'm it calling whoever said that on stage as a liar. But like, you know, you're that's not true. You, you can do it. I, I want to know wh- why did they do it? And what's, what's the focus? Where are they putting their talents elsewhere? Maybe the Warfront's armor do require a huge shift in it. Because I, I love the idea of us getting different armor with different tiers, so upgradable armor for different factions. It's not just, oh, the Horde get a red version of what the Alliance get. It's a totally different appearance. And that, to me... So really, instead of nine variants for cloth, you have 18 variants for cloth. You've got nine variants, three tier one, three tier two, three tier three for cloth for Alliance only. Then you have the I same have two thing ad- for Horde. I'm going to let you talk because I keep preventing you from talking. I know. What a what a, what a a jerk. <laughs> banned, <laughs> banned from my own podcast, episode 12. 12. I'm, I'm going to dislike this podcast. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse is only Shut allowed up. from episodes 1 to 12, and it's just going to be you from here on in. Lost Codex, I'm going to Lost Codex. I'm going to perform a coup. Um, <laughs> it's just going to be the Lost Genie. Now, what was I saying? Um, so my, I have two theories on this 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 uh, topic here. One is that they may be abandoning the the class fantasy side of the gear for now because they want more freedom. Uh, you know, they could actually view having to always make a, a set of armor look like it's for a mage as a restriction. You know, what if they want to be able to get something that does and, and give players more freedom in, in choosing things. You know, I've I've seen that argument made by other game studios. Um, they they want their artists to have more creative freedom, and so they've lifted like. Uh, re- and the other thing that I would say, if that's the case, is then let us customize our trans uh, our transmog on our items freely. Um, and and the second thing I would say is. And the the second thing I'm curious about is how many more allied races do we know that we're getting? And if if we can expect a decent number more, or at least a some not insubstantial number of additions, they're gonna need heritage armor and, and weapons and so on. And that could potentially be something that uh is would represent an offset in the artistic uh, character team the character art team. You know, we've got to make more sets for the Volpera and the High Elves and uh, the Redeemed Forsaken. You just you just upset a whole bunch of people just by saying Volpera. Issei is upset. I know I did. Um, <laughs> and High Elves, I, I, that was intentional. But that that's actually interesting because um, with introduction of allied races, maybe, you know, they're not creating racial kits for all these new races as much as they would be for a new race. But there is still aesthetic that they have to create um, and the best example, Void Elf aesthetic uses, it isn't really seen anywhere else. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jack. The High Mountain, obviously in High Mountain. Light Forged, Argus. Nightborn, all of Suramar. Dark Iron, there's not a lot there. And then the Magar use a lot of Warlords. You know, the Dark Irons use a lot of stuff that's in, in Dark. In, um, and there, there, I guess there is with the new drills and stuff like that, but the Void Elves specifically had a lot of stuff made specifically for them. So I guess with yeah. other allied races, the case could be could be argued the same, that that is where the artistic redistribution is happening. Um, I really hope that we see more um, Warfront themes. Uh, I would love if the, if the Baron's Warfront theme sets just differed completely it it it, it took a, a direction for a certain race and just went with it so in the barons maybe the maybe the horde armor for the barons campaign warfront campaign is torn themed which would be amazing because they've never done torn themed armor aside from the high mountain set there's no torn armor out there maybe some druid mm-hmm. sets that's it so Maybe the Baron's campaign is is specifically Torin, while the Alliance is specifically Night Elf themed. Just like yeah, there's that Skimp Night Elf armor, right? And that's actually we learned that that's actually not armor. That's actually a custom skin for a Night Elf. It's actually not a set, 
But is it really? Yeah, it, it was interesting because um, Handclaw, one of the one of the guys in my Discord, who's very uh, he, he meddles a lot in the data mining and he finds like really cool hidden files. He was actually one of the guys who found the original Lightforged bef- when Argus was being data mined, and he was the oh one really who, cool. He, he was the one who brought to attention that the Lightforged Dranai used a separate Dranai model, um, compared to regular Dranai. Anyway. Handclaw found that the new armor, and I you say new armor for Night Elves, the Archer, the Sentinel armor, for there's male version and female version, which is very Warcraft, World of Warcraft vanilla trailer. It's very, reminds us of that original Night Elf sort of aesthetic. It's not actually armor, it's specifically tied to a, a skin for that NPC. Um, mm-hmm. which is a little bit disappointing, but it doesn't mean that it can't be an armor one, it, armor set one day. So that'd be cool sure. if Alliance Warfront armor for Barons is, is Night Elf themed and it's Torn themed for, for Horde. Oh, or, you know, they said that the Horde gets pushed back all the way to Silvermoon in, uh, it, or to, to the Eversong barrier in, uh, with the Alliance taking over Eastern Kingdom. So, how cool would it be to revamp Eversong and have a Warfront Silvermoon where the Alliance is is laying siege? Maybe Sylvan, and this is, we're, we're totally going from transmog to totally bizarre character theories here, but what if Sylvanas decides to look over at the Sunwell and go, that, I'm going to use that. I say I made this theory. <laughs> I was the originator of this. Um, I just, I'm laughing because I just remembered that. Um, yeah. That actually, was you, right? I, 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 a... I totally, now that I think of that, that was totally you who said that, not me. That was you who brought it up, Jack. Um, Steal it all, you're just... Full credit to Jack. The, I, my I, ideas. I actually thought it was Latest and I who talked about it. It was Jack <gasps> and I who talked about it. I'm sorry. Sorry, Latest. I was about to wow. give you credit and it was Jack. So Jack and I were talking. And what if Sylvanas decides to turn her eyes to the Sunwell? And that creates well, a war front. Oh, can you imagine? Like that is so. That would be such a grand irony because she died defending the Sunwell right, from uh, right. Kel'Thuzad, from Arthas, who was trying to resurrect Kel'Thuzad using the Sunwell, and he succeeded. Um, as you all know, spoilers. And Warcraft three. Yeah, sorry <laughs> if you haven't played Warcraft three, but <laughs> surprise, Sylvanas dies. Um, and. Yeah, it would be a, a certain irony and, and a grand tragedy if she ended up using the Sunwell to to some purpose like that. Though I, I doubt like that the Blood Elves wouldn't stand for that. Uh, it'd be pretty shitty for them to lose the Sunwell again. Yeah. Though that could, her attempt at doing it, if she failed at doing it, may be a reason to oust her in the future or an additional reason. I would love um, just for Blizzard to have a reason to revamp Eversong um, and yeah. Silvermoon. I kind of yeah, want totally. the same treatment to be given to the Draenei, but at this point they had such a focus on Legion that I'm okay with them getting a new Exodar two expansions from now. Give it to them later. Give the Blood Elves some love right now. I say this as a Draenei lover. I say this as Draenei, my favorite race, one of my favorite races. Give the Blood Elves some love. Give the Blood Elves new Eversong Woods, new Silver Moon, um, in the form of a, a, a battleground in Eversong Woods. But it's not what it seems. It's not. It's not. It's not the battle for Lordaeron 2.0, where the alliance is just steamrolling their way through. There's insurrections going on with the horde because the horde doesn't want Sylvanas to use this Sunwell, but they have to hold the alliance back. But Anduin's not trying to kill all the Blood Elves, and maybe someone, an alliance general, is trying to kill all the Blood Elves. Garethos 2.0 kind of thing, and there's problems yeah. on both sides. Actual mor- morally gray stuff, not not what is current morally gray stuff. Yeah. So. I mean, that this is a total digression, but um, on the morally gray thing, I think that there is still a lot of opportunity for us to see some gray morality in BFA. Like, people forget that we haven't seen the whole damn expansion yet. We've barely seen first patch. Um, so there could be things just like that. Like, we've got real dilemmas here where, say, the alliance is being a little too righteous or maybe a little bit racist like they, they had been in the, in the past. Uh, and jumping to conclusions. So, no, we'll see. 
what I want with the morally gray, and we we really steered hard from transmog to morally gray, but that you know that's what happens with Sylvanas. What I want to happen with she's like gray, a black hole of she, morality, a void. I want <laughs> um, I want it to make sense. I I don't want suddenly the alliance to do this horrible thing just to give the horde a reason. Like, oh, look, see, the Alliance are doing bad stuff. It's like, no, they wouldn't do that, though. You know, Greymane wouldn't decide to throw a shrapnel bomb in a troll orphanage. That just doesn't make any sense. But it's entirely plausible Sylvanas would do that, right? So, and I say this yeah. as someone who plays equally Horde and Alliance, it doesn't need to be balanced. And and I forget what Blizzard developer said this years ago. I want to say it was the end of Warlords. Just because something happens to one faction doesn't mean it has to happen to the other. It doesn't mean that everyone has to get equal treatment on either side. Now, gameplay-wise, we do. You know, you can't introduce a new allied race, give Horde four allied races, and give Alliance one. That's a little bit cheap. You know, gameplay gameplay is first. But story-wise, things happen on both sides. There are losses on both sides. Taron Gregory was saying on Twitter the other day, you know, or not on Twitter, um, at the um, E3, he did a panel. And um, he was up on stage with... Yeah, the story panel. Yeah, the story panel. And he said, you know, these losses that we experience in the story, the, if we didn't lose anyone, it wouldn't be realistic. So these these characters die, Varian and, and Vol'jin. You know, Vol'jin got shafted. He got killed by a Felguard. But that was just to show the fluke horrifying incident of what can happen on a battlefield. Now, we know Vol'jin's story is not over. Varian, however, went out like a hero. Everyone says the Horde got gypped because Vol'jin died by an NPC and Varian got disenchanted by Gul'dan, of all people. But it's... Varian died a hero, Vol'jin died... You know, not everyone dies a hero. Not everyone dies in this glory and majestic way. We do know Vol'jin's coming back in some way. I was going to say, and Vol'jin's not dead. Right, he's best friends with the Loa of Death, you know... He's good. He's, he'll be back in spirit form, whatever. But it doesn't need to be balanced. Yeah. And I say this as someone, people are going to say, Lost Court, actually, you are clearly Alliance. No, I say this as someone, the Alliance heroes have been going neutral for years. Cadgar is neutral. Teralyon is now back on Team Alliance, but for a long little while he was neutral. Magni is neutral. Anduin likes everyone. Like, a lot of Alliance characters have gone just super friendly and neutral and Horde just lose everyone. So there's there's no win-win. And I don't think Blizzard needs to, if they do X for Horde, they have to do X for Alliance. If Sylvanas burns down Teldrassil by accident, but wants to kill all the civilians, they don't need to make the Alliance do the same thing, because that's not necessary. The Alliance wouldn't do something like that. But the Horde wouldn't either. The Torn and the Blood Elves and the Pandaren and the Orcs they're going to be like, I have a problem with this. And this is going to create conflict throughout the expansion. There doesn't need to be an exact even balance between them. And I don't I don't think many people realize that. People think, oh, well, the Horde got this. The Alliance needs this. It's like, no. No, you don't. You don't need balance. So long as everyone gets their... Everyone gets their just desserts eventually. So with that said about factions being balanced... I still want a torn rogue. Clop, clop, clop. Clop, clop. I mean, Draenei can... Like pillows on my hooves. Um, faction balance. Specifically, Battle for Azeroth. Yeah, there was the... Um, ultimately, I, as someone who plays both sides, I, I agree with Blizzard on that there doesn't need to be, if Horde get X treatment, Alliance needs to get it as well. And that's why I think the argument about everyone getting mad that we're that we're possibly taking down another war chief. People are like, man, Thrall stepped down, and then Garrosh was killed, and then Vol'jin was killed, and then we're gonna kill off Sylvanas. Why can't the Alliance have any problems? And it's like, well, that's the whole story of the Horde. Ever since Thrall, as much as I don't like Thrall, ever since he stepped down, everything just went to hell. Garrosh yep. led the Horde into this age of awesomeness for a second. And that went downhill. Vol'jin was tragically ripped from us. That was one of the biggest losses of Legion. But there's no way that you could have thought when Sylvanas took charge that it wasn't going to go badly. That it wasn't right. going to be like, oh, you know what? She's going to be around for a long time and we're going to be at peace. No one thought that. 
except Sylvana's fanboys who were like, oh, she's the one we need. And I think inherently the one of the big problems with the it needs to be equal thinking, at least in, in terms of story, is that they're different factions. That, that That's a very simplistic statement. But if the same things were happening to them in the same way, relatively, then they wouldn't be distinct. Like the Horde has problems and the Alliance has problems, but they're different problems. So you're seeing different stories unfold. Like the, the Horde has a oh, has always had a unity problem, or at least it has since it became something more than the old Horde. Exactly. And like the Forsaken have always been at the core of that. You know, they, they stood out as this. Sylvanas makes several comments to that in Christy Golden's book of of the, uh, you know, the, the Loctarogar horde and the forsaken are kind mm. of the outskirts and then the blood elves have joined and the goblins have joined and suddenly the numbers of unevenness have become a little bit more even with orcs torn and trolls and then blood elves undead etc and pandarin and and, and yeah and th- th- they're, they just eat they're just they're just there eating <laughs> sampling that like orc cuisine i mean that's that'd be the life to be a pandaren just eat sleep eat noodles and sleep i bet like horde Pandaren make a really good kimchi. Oh, you yeah, know kimchi probably, probably. Yeah, like trolls. I can imagine trolls eating a lot of spicy food. So troll, you know, this Issei is gonna listen to this, and Issei is gonna be like, "Damn it!" Issei really wants to do a podcast on food, so it'd be really cool to have. Well, totally do a podcast on food. I was actually, I'm actually, we talked about role play last time. God, I'm, I'm not even gonna like apologize for the ramble. Because that's what this podcast is. <laughs> the, whole, the whole point is, is is this is just it's called decoded. We're we're just decoding rambling statements. We're from, decoding from the whispers of the old gods. That's it. <laughs> as they flow into our minds. Um, but I'm stealing one of our RP concepts that we just threw out there. I, I want a paladin who's really into flower picking. Not even like making potions. He just really likes flowers. And now I want to know all about the. Uh, flora of warcraft like oh what are these flowers actually like i know that somebody on Wormrest, um who is a forsaken rpr has been cataloging these things uh, cannibal really? right that's actually really cool um i believe it's cannibal it'd be really cool if like um, blizzard put out like a sort of official chronicle but like kind of like that they did with the wow cookbook and the hearthstone cookbook but like for flowers or flora and fauna and stuff like like field guides to Azeroth. Yeah, field guides. That would be cool. It could be written by like Nessing Wary or something. Issei and I have actually talked about, we talked about this BlizzCon, how, how a pet project her and I would like to do would be to like write, like pick a theme and write, I would write, or her and I would write and she would draw in like these sketches and stuff like this for a uh, field guide. And it'd just be cool if Blizzard, you know, be had, awesome. Blizzard had like a, a field guide to orc clans, and it was all the little customs and different te- clan markings and stuff like that, and what each clan does. And yes, that'd be uh, you know, and, and chronicle do, like to the max. Do they still update their RPG, their uh, tabletop RPG? Um, no, because that would be very relevant in that situation. It'd be cool if Blizzard revisited, especially um, with. I talked about this on the podcast I was on the other day, uh, Realm Maintenance, but with tabletops becoming extremely mainstream nowadays with Critical Role and, you know, it's kind of, I don't want to say making a comeback because it never really went out of style, but it's really it's be, expanding it's in popularity. Cool. Cooler. Yeah. More people are aware of it now, I'd say. I, that's it. I, I wouldn't say, like, there was always a stigma, but I think it's just more people are aware of what it really is. And I would love if Blizzard tapped into that and decided to revisit their RPG and made a new age RPG from the world of Warcraft or the Warcraft RPG. I'd actually like to do a podcast on that because I had a campaign for two years set. Yeah. In, you had one of my characters in it. Uh, almost. They didn't actually get to Silver Moon. <gasps> I was going to have one of your characters, but they, the, the, the st- and if they're listening, my friend Devin's probably listening to this right now. Um, they really wanted the storyline to continue. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure if I talk about the, the, the whole campaign in a, in a podcast, I'll have you on, Jack, because it, it was a good two years, but it was fun because... I thought Minerva was in it, too. Um, was she? I, <laughs> Just... In kid form, yes. So the Tysamir, oh, the, the Tysamirs were there, and they got to meet. 
they got to meet uh, little Lord Land and Tysimir's children. I have this character concept, this family concept, and they're called the Tysimirs uh, from Kul Tiras, and they're this ambassadorial uh, noble family. He and came up with this concept ages ago. Literally ages Dari? ago. Um, Pandaria. Cataclysm? It was you who told me that Lord Landon had a very Tywin Lannister feel, and I had never read or watched Game yes. of Thrones, so I was like, I don't know what that means. And then I watched Game of Thrones, and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I was imagining. Um, and it's a character, that, a character in a family that I've expanded on, and Jack and I have really kind of ex- fleshed out their family and different different family members that were alive, which is really exciting for us, because as... as that's like an expansion bro this is this is our expansion when at blizzka when they announced that we're going to cult terrace and that there are four noble houses it was like man this is it but specifically in the warcraft rpg they haven't updated it in years and everything in the rpg is not canon unless they specifically specify yes there's that rub when when asked i think that was almost literally verbatim what they said yeah there are and there are things that they've actually changed from the RPG, I'm not going to say here on podcast, but that are relevant to Culture Ass and Zandalar, mm. um, that are that were considered not characters that were considered not canon that are suddenly re-canonized. But I would love a Blizzard re-explore their RPG because that'd be cool, like a new age. Because their RPGs are like you know this is all before WoW's lore was solidified and yeah. Make it an extension of the Chronicle now, um, and cool. it's like use it almost as like a, a lore extension device in the way that we were talking about at the very beginning of that this this thread of the conversation, which is to like expand on clans and and flora and fauna and customs and things you can't show in game but would love to express to us as players, as uh, you know, and maybe help people appreciate some of the writing. You know, when you can write unrestrained from uh, game mechanics and so on. Same reason we you give us short stories and novels. Hmm. I'm really thinking about like, man, I really want Blizzard to to, to expand on the RPG now, because it was really fun to play in there, but they didn't have Chronicle at the time, and now they do. Mm. And I've oh, been actually like, thi- sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say if you have D and D books, like just seeing the pictures and all the context, even just the charts are fun. I'd love that for a while. But go on. Sorry. I'm just thinking of different uh, different types of campaigns, and I, w- I was thinking about one, um, a campaign set with the Army of the Light. <laughs> but, like, instead of, like, set on Azeroth, it's, like, planet hopping. So it's, like, space, but it's not. It's, like, fantasy. Yeah, that's, to- that's totally cool, because space fantasy is awesome. <laughs> you- you're on a goddamn Chennai spaceship. And you're just running around, like and, and you can and you can literally come up with any idea because you could just visit any planet. You could, man, that'd be cool. I should do yeah, it. Yeah, they're 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 like D and D settings that are a lot like that. We should we should we should that'd be cool to flush out a campaign on podcast. Oh, that would be fun. That would be like an awesome series. I, I've actually con- con- contemplated, and I'm I don't want anyone to get excited about this, but I thought about if it would be cool to stream a Warcraft RPG uh, campaign DM'd by myself um, and have different members of the community on. I don't know how well it would go. I'm not really familiar with being a DM. I was a DM for t- two years, but it was literally the first time I'd ever played Dungeons & Dragons and the, literally the first time I'd ever... I, my friend said, let's, let's, play, let's play D&D. I said, okay. And they're like, we're going to play in the World of Warcraft setting. I said, oh, man. And I got all excited, you know, me and all my RP characters. I was like, okay, I'm going to have the best character. And they, they kind of said, okay, who's going to be the D? Who's going to be the DM? And they all looked at me. And I was like, whoa, whoa. I've never been a DM. I've never even played this game. And they said, yeah, but you know the lore. I said, so? I don't know the game. Anyway, I was voluntold. And uh, I ended up, they said, you're in charge. I was like, wow, okay. And it was actually really, really damn fun. So it'd be cool to do that on stream somehow or on podcast. You have great DM instincts, obviously. I you have this. And... I, I, there, there are some times where I like I fucked with them and like and you know I was new, so they were like, oh yo, like here's some feedback. This kind of sucked or that kind of sucked, and you know specifically one instance they had just left Brill 
my my D and D campaign was set oh. between the second and third war. Ooh. So Brill was alive, and they had just left Brill, and they said, "Oh, you know, the the NPCs are kind of weak." So they encountered some murlocs in the forest, and I buffed the murlocs to the point where like they almost died, and they're like, what? That's, "But that's how murlocs are supposed to be." <laughs> they're like, "What the hell? These murlocs are insane!" And I was like, "Yo, you, sorry, you said my NPCs. They're like these murlocs are like." Torin sized and the, the silver hand actually came in and saved them because they were dying. They were actually like, that should have been the end of the campaign, but it was so early on and I, I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I all your characters I, died permanently to Morlocks to Murlocks and because they had just gotten to the big bar fight and they're like, oh yeah, the RIP, the dudes with the shotguns weren't very strong. And I was like, okay, so the next session, <laughs> I was like, yo, here's some Murlocks and they're gonna fuck your day up. And they were laughing. They're like, what the hell? And I, what was really cool is I, I got to do a lot of puzzle things. Now I really want to do a podcast on that campaign and just kind of highlight it and go through it. Because I actually, I don't know if I told you this, Jack. Yeah. The, the end of the campaign, I had a a set fight with Grom Hellscream. And Ooh, cool. Jeff and I made a machinima cinematic for it. Did you end up using it? We ended up using it, and I, they didn't know. So I introduced them to these to these um, NP, to these NPCs early in the story, and they all kind of came together in this cinematic. And this this the end of the cinematic was scripted, but I made them roll for it. But I didn't tell them what the role was for. I just looked at their stats. Um, next time I do this this podcast, I'll make sure that I I put. I'll, I don't want you to watch it now. I want you to watch it live because it'd be kind of cool to, to film your reaction. But I'll actually put the cinematic in the podcast as well for anyone who wants to watch it. Uh, and my, my group was like, what the hell? Like they were so, so caught off guard. And Jeff and I had spent like two months working on it too. It was fun. That's awesome. Now I really want to do a campaign again. It's been a while. Now we're hyped. You've hyped, hyped you into it. All because of flower picking paladins no not all because of power blue. not it's because of Issei's love of warcraft food um i hope you guys enjoyed just jack and i just kind of shoot the shit here talking about transmog and and battle for azeroth and D D and these kind of shows won't really happen often and the reason why this particular episode happened like this was we're right on the cusp of some big events. And I'm not just talking like, oh, there's some cool stuff coming in game. I'm talking like lore wise, canonically, Azeroth is about to shift. Oh my God. The horde is on it's a war. Glorious. And it's kind of like, if, if this was Azeroth, like if I was speaking as keeper of the lost codex right now, but didn't know what the happen was happening in the future, the next couple of weeks are going to mess up Azeroth badly. And there's so many big things that are coming so soon. I mean, imagine you're, if you have a Night Elf character, like how they will feel when Teldrazil is burnt. It's, it's... Um, when it's attacked. And like, I really hope if there's any role players listening that you get to play these events as your Horde and Alliance characters. You get to go on the war march through Ashenvale. And what are you, what are your character's thoughts and all like 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 and even if you don't role play even if you're just playing your own server but you have like a little backstory for your character but you don't role play what what's your character's thoughts on all this you know a lot of people are like what's your Torin think what's your Torin think that's what I want to know and and a lot of people will be like oh yeah I play Horde and you know for the Horde burn Teldrassil but like take a step back for a second and what do you play you play a Blood Elf Paladin okay why is your Blood Elf Paladin Gun ho about burning down Teldrassil. Think about this. Think about the big war you just fought, and now you're shifting to this. Are are you in favor of this? Are you are you okay with this? And why? Yeah. Just think about all it. Those innocent you have a, lives. All those innocent lives. All the you know the 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 imbalance of nature, the disruption of the balance of nature, and just think about. 
or the alliance like what is what is possibly happening well you know the the march on lordaeron is is that the right answer is that you know anduin says to reclaim what is rightfully ours like that's a little bit of a drastic statement but then like, you go yeah is it is it rightfully and with things considering with you know christy golden's book it's kind of like what is what is going on like there is some major things happening Kulturas is returning to the fold after so many years zandalar we get to go to the ancient empire of zandalar very soon it's gonna it's wonders are gonna open up to us and they've always been there in the world we just haven't had a reason to go there so it's this there's so many exciting things on the on the on the horizon and and this is just the the fucking launch content like i keep think people are, are disregarding that sometimes when they're talking about what bfa is going to be i think people often do this with new expansion it's like their content patches have really stepped up especially in legion and we have no idea what's coming for us we have, no idea and blizzcon is going to reveal everything and that's true think about with legion with legion we went to the broken isles and then we went to the broken shore the tomb of sargeras and then we went to Argus. Mm-hmm. In a million years, I never would have thought we would have went to Argus in a patch, in in, in, a, in a patch set on Azeroth. Like it was such a huge leap. Battle for Azeroth is bringing a lot, and that's why I wanted this sort of ramble, very casual podcast. Because I think once this stuff starts hitting, our podcasts are going to be very one after the other. I want to do a podcast on the burning of Teldrassil. I want to do a podcast on the siege of Lord. Oh Ron. my God. Like, <gasps> bam, bam, bam. So I'm, I'm, what becomes I'm, of uh, Kalua and uh, her people. <laughs> Kalua, Kalua. That is Kalia Manitho's official uh, nickname is Kalua. Nickname. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we I'll, like another reason we did the ramble is because we've, we've speculated on all of these points a lot, or I haven't been involved in all the speculation, but I, I've, I've had my shit fair share of things to say. And the, we didn't, we felt like there wasn't much to add and we just really wanted to get into it. So I guess you could say there's almost a content drought for us, for us, like right now. And that content drought is, it's just, it's just sitting right there. Like we know what's coming in the weeks ahead. And I, I, I was racking my brain Saturday afternoon on what I could do for all week. I've been racking my brain and I really wanted to cover horde morality, but I thought horde morality versus alliance morality needs to wait until we know more. And so otherwise we're just guessing. We're just guessing. We're working and, off of incomplete information. And that's fun. But rather than do a whole podcast on that and then come back to the truth, I'd rather just cover it all in one. Yes. And so I'm not, a, I don't want to sound like I'm apologizing because people like probably listen to this just to, for us to ramble, but this was this was a bit of a just a shoot the shit kind of, and I'd like to do these shoot the shit podcasts every circle few months, jerking. circle jerking, just talking about everything and anything, complaining without any reason to complain. Or um, the transmog is a very valid reason. To it is a very things. valid reason. I take back <laughs> everything I just said. Uh, venting, I'm sure it's a bug. I'm going to tweet. <laughs> uh, we're going to tweet on Monday. Yes. Um, but these sort of at work and can do things about it. When these rant, these ramble podcasts are more just to kind of give a break from structured, concentrated podcasts and just kind of sh- casually shoot the shit. And I know there's quite a few podcasts out there where people who do that, and I enjoy watching them. So I'm curious what you guys thought of this. Maybe the disconnect is Jack and I aren't on camera, um, which you say Jack and I talked about last week. Eventually, we are going to start recording these podcasts live on camera, which might provide a bit more interest. Um, I think we talked about doing a BlizzCon. We also talked about doing a BlizzCon one. A BlizzCon one, uh, that would be really fun. I'll be there. By the way, if anyone's going to BlizzCon and you're listening to this, the Lost Codex, Jeffrey and Jeffrey and Jesse are going. And Decoded Hosts, Issei, and Jack are also going to BlizzCon. As well as a number of other fans who fans too. We've got um, like the Lost Codex. Latus isn't going. Damn you, Latus. Um, See, but this is b- why we don't we don't love Latus. This is this is another reason against him. But a whole bunch of people from our Discord are going, and there's actually going to be probably a Lost Codex Discord meetup. So if you want to be part of the Lost Codex Discord community, uh, join in the conversation. Talk talk with us in Discord. Talk about lore. Debate, ramble, post your transmogs. There's a selfie channel if you want to post your selfies, do whatever. Uh, and there's probably going to be a Discord meetup at BlizzCon. So if you're going to BlizzCon or you live in the Anaheim region 
and you uh, you want to talk some lore with the Codex or the Decoded hosts, we're going to be there. Um, but I would really like to know your feedback on what you thought of this sort of senseless ramble. Do you prefer the structured stuff? Do you prefer the story stuff? Do you prefer the interviews, like when I interviewed Issei and when I interviewed um, Jay the Bard? Well, what do you prefer? We've done a whole bunch of different theories, uh, different themes of podcasts. Uh, we've done the uh, the lessons, uh, not the lessons, the sort of uh, episodic RP character ones. We've done the book reviews, the uh, the essay debate about Forsaken and Kalua and uh, with Jack's first episode, and now this senseless ramble, pointless one. So I want to know what what do you guys think? Do you, something you enjoyed? Something you yeah, don't like want to see? Like a mix, like a trail mix, <laughs> a trail mix podcast of podcasts. We're going to bring this to a close. Thank you guys so much for listening to episode 12 of Decoded. If you're interested in more episodes of Decoded and you haven't seen all of our episodes, check us out on YouTube. Also on Twitch, iTunes, and SoundCloud. If you wish to... Listen to... Listen to the Kalia, the Kalia rant. And it's not a rant. It's a great discussion. If you haven't listened to it, that is episode nine. If you're interested in like some real in-depth debate on Forsaken, on Forsaken, and not even debate because Jack and I weren't even no, we on, agree <laughs> on everything on opposite sides. Episode nine, um, and at the fifty-three minute mark, there's a there's a theory, and I had three three people message me this week about this theory. That it's blown their minds. So I would love for you guys to go check out that theory. Episode 9, 53 minute mark, decoded Kalia. Not Kalia, Kalua. Um, and we're Kalia gonna... Onoharis. <laughs> we're going to stop this here. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to episode 12 of Decoded, a Lost Codex podcast. We'll see you guys next week for episode 13. And I really hope something happens this week. I really hope it's not the pre patch because I'm not ready for it. But I really hope that we can start this avalanche of content and topics because there's so much to talk about and i'm just waiting for that horn to blare i'm just waiting all right guys thank you so much and we'll see you next week thanks for listening thanks jesse thank you jack <laughs>